And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Your Lord be with us now as we learn from your word. Help us and instruct us and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Talking here about the wrath to come. His wrath is come is the title. His wrath is come. And uh, it's been almost a month and, and, a, and a half, really, since we've been in the book of Revelation, believe it or not. Um, I left the study for a while just as we were dealing with other things and the holiday season and all that. Um, <clears throat> one thing I don't want to do, though, is, is uh, miss the context of, of where we're currently at. So if you were to look at Revelation chapter 6 back there, you find there the, uh, the seals of persecution of believers. Now, as we've often discussed, um, these seals are something that was present but is now loose. As uh, God gives, gives uh, leave to, to the, the devil and his minions and the world at large to, to commit these acts towards believers. Uh, verse 10 really gives us indication of who's the main focus of these, these hardships and these trials and tribulations when it says... And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So this was, this was a time of waiting. We see many in heaven that had the word, that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had, crying out to God saying, how long is this going to go on for? How long is this going to last? The response was that until their fellow servants, their brethren should be killed likewise. So the time frame was, was such that until all of them were killed, this would continue, this trial, this tribulation, uh, the, the seals being opened and the tribulation coming on upon people. In verse 12, that sixth seal is opened, and we get what I refer to as one of those timestamp keys to understanding the book of Revelation and end times as a whole, where it says, And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And if you were to just go through the scriptures as we did, you'll find the sun and moon being darkened as, as a key point where, where a certain event is coming to pass. You're transitioning at that sun and moon being darkened. And this gives us a great time stamp, a great way of understanding the scriptures that are to come and the ones that precede it. 
Verse 15 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. They cried out, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. <clears throat> For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is the great day of the Lord, the great day of his wrath that is presently come upon these that are standing there, these that are hiding themselves as kings of the earth under the dens and under the rocks. So when you turn the page over to Revelation chapter 7, what you find is almost a segue or an aside to what's going on. Essentially, you're seeing what's happening on earth, and now you're going to see what's happening up in heaven. That's indicated by uh, John speaking when he says, After these things I saw the four angels stand in the four corners of the earth. And he's given this almost panoramic overlaying look of the entirety of the earth. The four corners of wind are held, and then the angels come and they perform what they're supposed to do. He says, Hurt not the earth, neither the trees, nor anything that in them is, until I have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And that's what happens in the ensuing verses, where the tribes, each of them, 144,000 total, are, are given that mark in their forehead, sealed, and, and, and that's to perform a certain task, which is to come. So I believe that those 144,000 sealed are Old Testament saints. I believe they had already died, passed away, they're in heaven, now they're being marked for a certain job, for a certain task, given a certain honor, if you would. When you get to verse 9, completely separate from the tribes of Israel, which are now sealed, you find, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, and here's a key word, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palms in their hand and they cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So what I've done in my Bible is I've, I've highlighted clearly that word all and connected it with the first thing that they said. They cried out salvation to our God. That's, that's a clear indicator that all the nations kindreds and tongues is a big group of everybody that's ever existed. Why? Because there's nations that don't exist today and won't exist at this time. There's tongues that don't exist today that will exist at this time. And so all means throughout all time. And they're crying out salvation. These are the saved that are being captured or being carried away or being caught up to, this, um, to heaven at this time. If you were to look over in verse 4, this great, mul 14, sorry, this great multitude, it says, and I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. He was asked the question, Who are these? And he said unto them, These are them which came out of great tribulation. So what do we have? We have all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people crying salvation who are caught up out of tribulation. That connects perfectly with Matthew chapter 24, where it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the moon shall not give her light. And, the, and then that's the timing of what we know as the rapture after the tribulation, and right before God's wrath is about to be poured out, which we read about in Revelation chapter 8. See, all of this is happening, this tribulation of the saints. God pulls them out before the time when every single one of them would have their blood shed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And God pulls them out, and now things are about to take a switch. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God's not just going to sit idly by and let men kill his saints. Let men destroy his saints. He let it for a time until his, the fellow brethren should suffer like things, God said. But it seems like God, God was fed up. He'd had enough. And so he pulls out saints in that great event we know as the rapture or the catching away or the, or the or caught up. Um, event takes place, the rapture takes place, and God here, he's now going to respond to what has happened before. And so he does respond. And I like how God's wrath always comes. God doesn't just blow up. God doesn't just fly off the handle. He showed great restraint in seeing his saints being destroyed, telling the ones in heaven to wait for a while. Now he catches up the rest of them, them which are alive and remain until the coming of the day of the Lord. He brings them home with him, labels the 144,000, puts a mark upon them. And now again, he's not just flying off the handle with his wrath. He's doing just like he did in John chapter 2. He's making a small 
a scourge of small courts. Essentially, he's just he's just sitting there like he did right before he went to the temple, and he's just he's making a whip. He's not flying off the handle. He's not angry. The Bible says, "Be angry and sin not." God doesn't sin. God doesn't blow up. God doesn't God doesn't have that in him to just fly off the handle. He is fashioning that whip of cords, getting ready to pour out his wrath. And we see that in chapter eight and in verse one. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I think that's about how long it would take to take a bunch of small cords and put them together and prepare a whip. Prepare your wrath to be poured out. And this is exactly what God did. Uh, go with me to, uh, you keep your finger there in Revelation. Go to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. <clears throat> We're talking about that silence in heaven that was about the space of a half an hour. And we often find God responds after giving this sort of um, suspense, right? He sees them buying and selling in the temple, and he gives suspense to those that are standing by as, as he waits for his wrath to come. And in Mark chapter 15, this is a familiar passage, look at verse 25, it says, and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief, chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. It's amazing. God... God is being reviled, he's being mocked, he's being challenged to get down from the cross. Just as when in Revelation we're reading about God's being mocked, he's being challenged. They can't get at God, but he's, people are destroying his own people through that tribulation. They're, they're mocking God, challenging him to do something, challenging him to act, it seems. And just as he's doing in the context of Revelation with that silence in heaven, about the space of one half an hour, you can imagine what that would be like. Just almost this... this, this silence as, as all this was going on you would think there would be so much trouble and tribulation and strife and, and, and explosions and destruction and then there's silence it seems the same way it happens here where Christ is being mocked and then at that sixth hour there was darkness over the whole land about the ninth hour can you imagine complete darkness? I picture it just like that. Not like our eclipses happen where there's a little bit of light. I picture it was almost as if the lights went out for three hours. Imagine the silence that would take hold of people, the fear, the awe, the, the, the dread, as, as it's a complete darkness. They were just mocking the Christ of God, the King of Israel. They're just reviling Him, and suddenly the lights go out for three whole hours. But it's broken. This is God building suspense. This is God fashioning that whip of cords, just preparing for what's to come. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Here he breaks that darkness, breaks that silence, and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them stood by, and when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come and take him. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top and to the bottom. You see that it went from them mocking and, and attacking and challenging God to this darkness, this, this, this pause. This, this moment where everyone's just like, what's going on? And as soon as the lights come on and God cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The wrath of God falls in this moment. Though it didn't fall on the people that were standing there, it fell on the sun. 
right? It's, it fell on his son who carried the sins of the whole world upon his shoulders at that time. And the wrath of God falls right after that pause. And immediately it causes such turmoil in everybody that they're, they're running around trying to, trying to give him a drink. They're running around waiting to see if Elias is going to come. Great fear fell over all of them. And he cries out one last time. And that veil of the temple is rent in twain from the top and to the bottom. All these supernatural events that come as a result of, of what had just happened and following that time suspense so that the full effect of the wrath to come is felt by all those who are present. If you were to go back to Exodus chapter 10, when the, that's Exodus chapter 10 one of the judgments on um, <clears throat> Pharaoh and on Egypt was a darkness which may be felt. <laughs> and I think that's what people experienced at this time. You imagine something so dark that it could be felt. I've experienced that something close to this maybe once. I was in... Uh, I was traveling back from when I lived in Edmonton, and I stopped somewhere between between Sudbury and who knows. But I needed to use the washroom, so I stopped at this little rest offload set or whatever. I stopped and I turned and I closed the door behind me. And it was nighttime then, and there was no moon out. And when I closed the door, I took two steps, and it was just like whoosh, as the car closed, complete darkness. I couldn't even find my my car. I couldn't find anything. And I'm just up there, and I'm thinking about bears, and I'm thinking about what, who knows what is out there. And, and I felt the presence of that darkness, and it was, it was something to, to behold. And I bet you it wasn't even as dark in that moment as what these were experiencing at this time. But it's all there for God to give a pause and a space before he pours out his wrath. And I believe that this silence there... And that darkness are, are similar. The silence that we found in Revelation in chapter 8, we can go back there, Revelation chapter 8, was similar. It was a silence that was felt. It was a silence that was experienced that told a tale of a pause, almost the calm before the storm, before God is about to pour out his wrath upon the people. <clears throat> Following song and praise, which we saw in heaven, we saw them rejoicing and singing salvation and and saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, and honor, and thanksgiving all to God. There's just this silence, this somber calm that happens over all heaven. Look at verse 2, and it says, And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And so here the angels received their trumpets. Those trumpets, I believe, were going to give a certain sound. It was, it was a call, a sign, a, an, an observance of each one of the events that was about to take place. As one angel sounds, something happens. As the next angel sounds, something happens upon earth. And you see also, though, this other angel is given something where it's a um, golden censer, and the Bible says that it was within it is the prayers of all saints. And if there wasn't ever a charge or an encouragement to get on your knees and start praying, this is one of them. Here, God gives us a glimpse into heaven in that he keeps the very prayers of his saints as an incense that he can burn, as a sweet-smelling savor that he can use for such a time as this, or for such a time perhaps in our own lives. God has our prayers there contained and before a golden altar that is before his own throne. So when we cry out to God, we have that promise that that's where our prayers go. We can see then the power that our prayers have. We see then the, the influence that they will have in the time to come. And you got to think they got to have that same influence in our lives right now. And you also see the reach of our cries unto him. So at this time then, when we see a, a glimpse into the scriptures like this, what do you think we should be praying? Well, look at verse 5. It says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So we, here we see that God takes the prayers, has the angel ignite them with fire, cast it to the earth, and what comes out is 
voices. What comes out is thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. And I believe then one of our major prayers should be that these voices that are heard, this thunder that happens, the lightning and earthquakes, we should pray that each one of these, when it comes to pass, would have the full effect on those that it's intended to have. God pours it out, drops that that incense into the fire, gets it ignited and casts it to the earth to a purpose. And the purpose is that all the prayers of saints that had come would have their full effect. And I believe we should be praying that all of these actions should bring the glory of God. In some place it talks about how the everlasting uh, gospel is preached to all the earth. Maybe that's one of the voices that come. Maybe this earthquake is going to be someone who's heard the gospel, but they're kind of teetering on the idea of whether or not they can believe. Maybe it would, maybe an earthquake or a great disaster, lightnings or thunderings, would cause them to just realize that what they have heard was the truth and to, and to believe on God in that moment and get right. Whatever the fact, we need to understand that our prayers are influencing these times to that much of a degree. And we need to pray to that effect that they would do exactly as God has intended them to do. We saw in verse 6 that the angel prepared to show what I believe is the finger of God at this time. Now, if you were to go back into Exodus, you're going to find the ten plagues of Israel. And you can take each one of these ten plagues and look at them in the context of what we're about to see as regard to God's wrath, and you can start to draw parallels. It's really interesting if you go and do that study. But the one thing that you really see is that the, the opening of the seals previous in chapter 6 um, have the idea that, and, and then and in Exodus, it's um, water being turned into blood, it's frogs coming up out of the streams and being everywhere in the earth. We see that those are all things that can be mimicked by the world. And that's exactly what happens in that. Every single time they would do one of these, the, magi the magicians would, would simulate it. Even, even up to the tribulation that we see in Revelation, the earthquakes that we see, they can be imitated. They can be duplicated. We, we have the technology now that everything you read about back in Revelation chapter 6, it's no marvel that those things could be performed by men to the end that they would destroy the people of God. But as we see by type, there comes a point where the actions that happen could be nothing else but the finger of God. In Exodus, the magicians actually tried to simulate lice and flies and the great moraine and the boils and the hail and fire and the, and the locusts and the darkness and the slaying of the firstborn. I mean, they'd given up after a while. But immediately after the lice came, the magicians tried to imitate the destruction and could not. And so it was nothing, and undeniably so, but the finger of God that was happening. And I believe that's what we see when we roll over into Revelation chapter 8. We see things that are supernatural that could be nothing but God's hand <clears throat> on earth. And in verse 7, you see that starts, okay? And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Okay, we've all seen hail. But have we seen fire and it mingled with blood? And it says, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up. And all green grass was burnt up. So the action that happens is supernatural in and of itself. But then also what, what happens as a result, the third part of trees being burnt up. That's pretty astonishing. What about this? All green grass being burnt up. I mean, that's something that's, that's supernatural. I mean, I've seen, I've seen dry, yellowed grass catch fire and go on its own, but when a green leaf of grass catches fire, that's something spectacular, that's something special. Now we all gotta think about our, our lawns and even as we look out here, all that green grass. At this time, when the hail and fire mingled with blood comes, the Bible records that all green grass will be burnt up. It's amazing to think about. I'm so glad I won't be there. Verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. So here it's as it were a great mountain that was cast in. It doesn't actually say a great mountain was sent there. And so it's something that is similar to a great mountain, as it were. 
Burning with fire was cast. So we find something so huge that was thrown. Again, supernatural event taking place here. God says that our prayers could move great mountains if we would have faith the size of a grain of mustard. Here God just takes something that, as it were, something similar to a great mountain, and just casts it. It's full of fire, and it's cast into the sea. What a marvel to behold something like that. And the third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. We see that great destruction that comes upon all the earth at this time, but God's almost putting it into sections. First he destroyed the trees and the green grass. Now he's going to destroy the waters and the life that's in it, including the boats and the ships that dwell in the waters. Verse 10 says, And the third angel sounded, and then there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made, made bitter. And how we find the fresh water, one third of it is made bitter or poisonous. It's made, it's made so that it can't be consumed by human. The Bible says that many men are dying because of the water that was made bitter. Once this star fell from heaven, burning like a lamp, it destroyed a third part of the rivers. It destroyed a third part of the fountains of waters and made anyone who would drink of these, these uh, sources of water sick. And, and most of them just died because of the bitterness, because of the poisonous of it. Verse 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And so this isn't, again, just another event where uh, the sun is covered, where there's an eclipse, or where there's, there's cloud coverage that just makes it so the sun is not seen. It's actually saying that the sun was smitten, the moon was smitten, the stars were smitten for a third part of them, and it says they shone not. In other words, they were darkened for that time. They were smitten so that they did not even shine, the Bible records. And it says this, for a third part of the day, and the night was likewise. So we saw in the beginning of this chapter a silence in for a half an hour. We saw at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was darkness that lasted for three hours, the Bible records. But here we find the sun smitten where it shines not for one third part of the day. Now, if we were to just just, favor, just say, hey, a day is 12 hours of the total, okay? 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. That means that one third of that would be four hours of complete darkness where the, shot, the sun is not shining for that part. Complete darkness for those times. That's a judgment in and of itself. We might have flashlights for a while, but if this goes on for any length of time, it's going to get to the point where basically once those four hours of complete darkness come, there's nothing you can do but sit and dwell in darkness. And uh, it's going to be a sad time because the light of the gospel, the light that Christians be as to be the light of the world, they've been removed from there. They, they're gone away, far, far away, up in heaven, beholding this only. These are all awful experiences, and I'm glad that as a believer today, I will miss out on these things as God's wrath comes upon because all nations, kindreds, and tongues are going to be taken out of great tribulation. If I don't die before all these events come to place, we're just of old age, and I end up in this time of great tribulation, I'll either die in those events or I'll be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds and those that are dead in Christ which rise first. And I won't have to worry about these things as the Lord's wrath comes upon these people. And the reason for that is because way back when, 2,000 years ago, when God's wrath fell upon mankind, it fell gloriously and graciously upon Jesus Christ. But look what we have to deal with now 2,000 years later. The unbelievers that are mocking and ridiculing and, and contemning the Lord and his people. Instead of them looking back to when God's wrath fell upon his only begotten son so that they could be saved, go up and be caught away in the rapture and be saved from the things which are to come. Instead of that, they look to themselves, they mock God, and now they face these horrible events that are going to come upon all the earth. Imagine a third part of all the trees around you, one in three burned up, all the green grass that you behold 
burned up. One third of the waters literally become blood. The creatures in there all die. The ships are all destroyed. One third of the water, can you imagine if you had three bottles of water in front of you and one of them is going to poison you and kill you because it's been made wormwood? Imagine such a time as this that they are going to face because they did not accept what happened when the Lord put his wrath upon Jesus so that he could, by grace through faith, turn away the wrath that is due upon us for our sins. God, in his mercy, did what he did and poured out his wrath there. God, in his judgment in Revelation chapter 8, is going to do the complete opposite. He's going to judge righteously those that have refused, those that have rejected, and those that have turned away, mocking and ridiculing and, 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 and casting in the teeth of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we were to read down in verse 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. And so each one of those woes is a cry of indication that there are three trumpets waiting to sound and we've just gotten started. We've seen, we've seen four of them take place. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the world is a very wonderful place to live at this time of Revelation chapter 8. And yet there's more woe to come. We haven't even seen the worst of the God's wrath poured out in the scriptures here. So what do we got to do about this? Well, first of all, we should get in Goshen. Go with me to uh, Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. So the best thing that we can do is get in Goshen. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 9. And these are the believers. These are, if you're saved today, you're simply waiting for the coming of the Lord to capture you, to gather you away, or you're waiting to pass away and be absent from the body and present with the Lord. You have access to Goshen. Look what it says in Exodus 9 and verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So as he's pouring out his wrath upon an entire world, at this time Egypt was known, I guess, for being mostly what would be considered the inhabited world, at least the major center point. The, the world as a type is here, and yet there's this picture of a place in the world where God's people are saved from the hail that is falling. We need to be in Goshen. That's like being in Christ. That's like being under the blood. That's like being in the promised land. That's like being safe in the arms of God is what the indication is here. Those that are in Goshen, those that are of the children of Israel, those that are believers on him, experience none of the hail that is to fall. But look over in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 18. It says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. And what we saw in Revelation chapter 8 was many signs of things that, that we've never experienced on this earth. And the same thing that Egypt has now experienced. From the foundation thereof until now they've never seen this type of hail. And from the foundation of the world until Revelation chapter 8, the same thing can be said. Verse 19 says, Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Okay? So I like what it says next. Verse 20. God just gave the proclamation. He just said, Hey, there's hail coming. Bring your sheep. Bring your cattle. Bring your beast and every man indoors. Verse 20 says, And they, or sorry, he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And I believe that's what's going to take place as a type portrayed here, but as the reality in the time to come. That's what's going to take place in the time leading up to God's wrath after the rapture of the church. There's going to be people today, like our family members, that have heard a clear presentation of the gospel. There's going to be people there that know the way of salvation and yet to date have refused it. There's going to be destruction that falleth in order as God allows it, trumpet sounding and destruction coming upon people. The word of the Lord is going to be clear in many eyes and hearts and minds of people who have heard it from the saints 
that were upon earth giving it to them as they were go figure trying to destroy them trying to trying to uh, trying to kill them at that time and yet when the hail is about to come the word goes forward hey maybe that's like when the prayers of the saints come down maybe you prayed for a loved one maybe you prayed prayed for a family member maybe you prayed for somebody that you witnessed to at a door when the when the prayers of the saints come to this earth in the form of the altar and you hear voices perhaps one of the voices is going to say just like it did in exodus here Send therefore now, gather thy cattle, bring them into the fold, bring them into the house. The word of the Lord resonates with people that are still upon this earth, and then the choice is going to be made. I believe at each one of these points of wrath, there's going to be opportunity for people that have heard, that have received, but just chose never to believe, that have heard the truths of Scripture, and they'll be able to do what these people did here. They'll either fear the word of the Lord, and they'll do what it says, or they will regard not the word of the Lord, and they won't. We're either having people that fear and believe and receive the Lord and, and his word, or we're having people that hear the word and, yeah, regard it not. I'm not interested in that. I, I'll take my chances standing in the hill. I'll take my chances out in the fields. I don't need to go into my house. They're regarding not the word of the Lord at this time. Remember, we're all in verse 26 up in Goshen. We're all in the promised land. We're all saved. We're all in heaven. We've been raptured away. And yet here in Egypt, here in the world, as in Revelation chapter 8, the choices are made. The word of God has been proclaimed. Fear it or don't, everyone will get the opportunity to. Verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail very grievous, such as was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. God has promised, poured out his wrath, and there's people that died because they refused to heed the word of God at this time. They refused to fear the word of God at this time and get into the house and get into Christ and get into salvation that was promised them. Even though they were still in the world, God promised them a escape. God promised them an opportunity to find safety, to find comfort, to find him at this time. So I believe that that's just one of the types, one of the pictures of what we'll see when Revelation chapter 8 plays out. We'll start to see these, these events come to pass and honestly be encouraged by this at this time. This is why when we go soul warning, hey, who knows? If something like this takes place to somebody that you've really gotten into the gospel with them, you've really given them clear. You know how often your heart breaks when you walk away and they're like, yeah, I get it, but how about this for Muslims? But my parents would kill me if I prayed. Right? How many times have we heard that? Or, or a young young child, and they hear it all, and right up to the point where they would believe it, and their parents snatch them away, and your heart breaks for that person. Soul warning has just as lasting of effect. And you know what we can do to couple our soul warning? We can take that person's name down. We can take that situation down. And we can pray for them, and who knows whether it be God's will that these people, yeah, they don't get caught away in the rapture with us. They're not safe in Goshen, but they're going to hear the word, and they will have the opportunity to heed it or to refuse it. Again! Because we went and we, and we warned them. Because we went and we prayed for them. And this is what I believe is, is the greatest ministry that a believer can have at this time which will last. And that's just praying for the people that have heard that they would receive the message as it is cast to the earth. The voices ring out. The thunderings, the lightnings, the earthquake brings great terror. Then God brings his supernatural response to his anger and indignation to a world that destroyed his people. But there's still opportunity, I believe, at this time for people to be saved. If they've heard it, if they know the truth, and they just want to obey what God says, believing Him, receiving Him, calling upon the name of the Lord at this time, there's still an opportunity. I'll give you it. It's, it's, it's few and far between because the Bible says at this time there's going to be people that see God coming in the clouds and are still reviling Him and rejecting Him. Granted, but there's still those chances that some would believe, some would receive. And it's a, as a direct result 
of the saints preaching, the word that comes forth, the prayers that are made, and then God's wrath reinforcing the fact that he means business. He's serious. He, he's not messing around, right? It's just like, a, it's just like a, a deathbed repentance. When somebody is on their deathbed and they're facing, in a few moments, death, they're very receptive quite often to receiving the gospel because they know that their end is nigh. In the same way, there's going to be people that have heard it. They know their end is nigh. God says, hey, I mean business. He steps in with his wrath, and there's still a chance for them. Glory to God. The wrath of the Lord fell upon Jesus Christ on Calvary for me, and I'll never have to face this. Amen. Hallelujah. God's wrath to Christ is much better than God's wrath being to me. I don't take lightly, you know, people say free grace. It costs Jesus everything to take the wrath of the Lord upon him. But he did that for his great love, and that's what supersedes the actions that he took, the result of God's wrath upon him. He did that for me so that I wouldn't have to face the eventual end of all men, which is the Lord's wrath in the flesh present, and experience not only in this life, but as we know, the life which is to come. Thank you, Father, for